Hey there, we're going to talk a little bit about prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, which is an important topic in microbiology because we need to know why these teeny tiny cells are different from the bigger ones that we're more used to and how they're able to accomplish their goals. Now, of course, the biggest part of prokaryote versus eukaryote is in fact the idea that prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus or actually more specifically any membrane bound organisms. So pro meaning before the karyote, which is the kernel or nucleus and you meaning true nucleus. So here's our nucleus and here you can see there's not. Of course, part of the issue is that these guys are so much smaller. This is not to scale today because if I want to be able to see the structures of the bacterial cell, but a bacterial cell is only about the size of the mitochondria in a eukaryote. So eukaryotes need all this extra membrane to actually be able to accomplish their goals. But sometimes it seems to make their goals easier. So thinking about how prokaryotes are able to do things is important. So we'll examine the major functions of life and how these two cells use different structures to basically accomplish them. Not a lot of detail yet because we're going to get into the details of each of these things going forward. All right. So let's start with reproduction and evolution because they are both key features of living organisms and they both rely very heavily generally on DNA. So knowing where the DNA is and how it's structured is the key part of understanding this. Now, in a eukaryotic cell like this lovely animal cell, you've generally got DNA hiding out in the nucleus. It's got its very own membrane called the nuclear envelope. And the nuclear envelope even has holes to let bits in and out the nuclear pores. So that allows the RNA to move between to make things happen. So there's a lot of control and systems and stuff going on in eukaryotic cells related to the DNA. And it is very well encased. The other thing that eukaryotic cells have is they have centrosomes, which are part of their division process because dividing a cell with a nucleus and in many cases, multiple chromosomes is quite complicated. And the cell goes through an entire mitosis process with many steps. This is quite different from the bacteria cell. So our prokaryote identified here generally by a bacteria has DNA and the DNA does tend to cluster together because it's all connected, but it's in one general spot and it is not surrounded by any membrane. We call that general spot the nucleoid. The nucleoid is where the DNA hangs out. Another big difference is that bacteria typically only have one chromosome and it is one big circle, although it is a big enough circle that you can see it often tangles up here. But that is not all they have in terms of DNA. They also typically have small pieces of DNA, small circular DNAs called plasmids that can transmit from bacteria to bacteria across structures called a pilus or pili, sometimes pili. An F pilus specifically, or sometimes called a sex pilus, can connect to prokaryotes and allow a plasmid to go across. So part of the evolutionary process of bacteria relates to the DNA traveling from one to another. The reproductive process of bacteria involves the DNA simply making a copy of itself and splitting in two along with the cell, which is called binary fission. And that's something we'll get to in the future. So big difference, DNA in a nucleus, DNA in just a generalized nucleoid location. All right. So now we will move forward to our next one, which is about metabolism, energy production, intake, and waste. So all of this is important to cells. Cells need to be able to make energy. So when you learn about eukaryotic cells or cells in general, you often learn about the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cells where all the energy is made. Obviously prokaryotes don't have a mitochondria because they don't have any membrane bound organelles. Although interestingly enough, Endosymbiosis suggests to us that the mitochondria was once a prokaryotic cell, was once a bacteria of some kind able to do this process of energy production. So we assume the useful components of energy production are here. They're just not in any viewable location. And in fact, a lot of times they're embedded into the cell membrane, which is where they are in the mitochondria as well, which is why that's interesting. Eukaryotes also have lots of other stuff to help them out. They have ways to uptake and get rid of wastes. 
So they uptake things in their vesicles and they remove waste through lysosomes and peroxisomes and things like that. Bacteria cells have to take things in and out just through their cell membrane, so basic transport and or diffusion. And they can store things inside the membrane. They just do it in very small containers called inclusions. And inclusions are often coated by a little bit of protein, so it's got something to hold onto them. Sometimes they do have a lipid membrane, but it is often a monolayer instead of a bilayer. So just a layer of lipids like a little blanket. Sometimes they are simply polymers of a substance that have stuck so tightly together that they are visible under an electron microscope. But this is how prokaryotes can store various substances. When they want to get rid of them, though, they really just need to kick them out because they can't do any internal digestion. Speaking of digestion and all the steps of metabolism, you need enzymes, which are proteins. And making your own enzymes and making your own proteins from DNA is a key part of the metabolism process. And ribosomes, which are actually in both, you have ribosomes here and you have ribosomes here, in the eukaryotic cell, key component in making proteins, all enzymes pretty much start at a ribosome. Now they're similar, but not the same. The prokaryotic ribosomes are a little smaller. We call them 70S, and the ribosomes in the eukaryotes are a little bit bigger. We call them 80S, and there are reasons for those numbers that we're not gonna deal with today. Now, of course, in prokaryotic protein production, the ribosome simply gets the information through an RNA very quickly from the nucleoid, and produces the protein right into the cytoplasm. However, in a eukaryotic cell, the ribosomes typically produce the proteins associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, which go through a whole process, drop things off in the Golgi, have their proteins adjusted, so it's a much more multi-layered process with many more structures and a lot more membranes, but it still does the same job. All right, so moving on again into part of our response to the environment. So I'm gonna break response to the environment into a couple of things, and we'll start with the idea of protection and structure, which is not letting the environment get to you. So a key part of not letting the environment get to you relates to having good external protection. And eukaryotes do have some external protection. Everybody has a plasma membrane pretty much, and they're very similar amongst the different organisms. The only one with a different plasma membrane is actually archaea. We'll get to that in the future. And then there are cell walls, the outside of the cell. Some eukaryotes do have cell walls. Most things that we classify as animals do not, and some of the smaller protists do not. But for example, fungi have a chitin cell wall, so that's a type of protein that surrounds them. Then we have algae in cases have different cell walls. Diatoms have silica around them. Many plants have cellulose around them. So there are a lot of cell walls that do some protective things. Bacteria also have cell walls and they are made out of completely different substances, which is why they're interesting. We'll get a little bit more in depth as to how these cell walls are made because bacteria have three or four major types of cell walls. But almost all of them contain a substance called peptidoglycan, peptide for protein, glycan for carbohydrate. It is a sugar protein based substance that is surrounding the entire cell membrane in some manner. Some cells also have a lipopolysaccharide. That one is lipo for lipid polysaccharide carbohydrate. So again, things attached to carbohydrates that also go completely around the cell. The lipopolysaccharide actually triggers immune responses in multicellular creatures. So it's a very good protective mechanism, but can be kind of interesting. Some bacteria also then have further things along their outside called a glycocalyx. And the glycocalyx are glyco for sugar, sweet sticky things that they use to attach to their environment because they do a little bit less moving, a little bit more holding on to something. And the glycocalyxes could be a capsule which tends to be a harder coating around each individual bacteria, or a slime layer. And the slime layer is secreted so the bacteria can stick to a substance and then stick to each other. This helps form biofilms. And those both are very different from the eukaryotes. So cell walls in prokaryotes have peptidoglycan, maybe LPS, they may have a capsule, they may have a slime layer. All of those are different from the eukaryotes, which either don't have a cell wall at all, 
or have something like chitin, silica, or cellulose. Now, one of the things the eukaryotes do have is they have the cytoskeletal system, so a lot of internal proteins that help them maintain the structure of their very large cells, something prokaryotes don't, in fact, need. Prokaryotes do have one more little additional thing, which are the fimbriae. They look like little hairs sticking out of the cell, and they're often used, again, for attachment, so grabbing onto something and holding to it. So prokaryotic structure is built partially on the cell, but partially on the architecture of how many cells stick together and grab hold of something. All right, so finally, in examining how we respond to the environment, some of our cells move. Most animal cells have some sense of movement. Some of them move using microfilaments, which are essentially little fibers that can contract and pull parts of the cell around. And some of them have flagella, which are little tails. So tails allow the cell to move. Eukaryotes can also have cilia. So these are also little hair-like protrusions, but they're very different from the fimbriae on the prokaryotes. The cilia are made out of larger microfilaments, which help hold on to things, actually microtubules. So are the flagella in the eukaryotes. Interestingly enough, prokaryotes do have flagella to help them move, but they're different. They're made out of a different type of protein structure and they're controlled in a different way. Also, many prokaryotes have more than one flagella and sometimes in interesting places. So they'll have them one on each end or scattered throughout the cell. And there are a lot of different terms associated with the different types of flagella and how they're used. So a big part of all of these structures as we consider them and how they look is thinking not only what they do, how they help with movement, protection, structure, metabolism, reproduction and evolution, but also how we use them for classification. So when looking forward to how we classify bacteria, we very often do it by what is the structure of the cell wall? How is the cell shaped? What type of appendages does it have? And does it have any kind of protective substance? All right, that's the majority of important cell structures between prokaryotes and eukaryotes and how they are different.